developing scientific temper, as you'll realize, is not the title of a chapter in a science textbook. It's more an attitude that we need to develop. And I'd go even a step further and I'd, and I'd say it's, it's a way of life uh, that all of us must have in our personality. But would it be surprise you if I tell you that if you develop scientific temper and nurture it in your personalities, you're opening up a completely new avenue to exhibit patriotism towards our country. I mean, this association is a little difficult to fathom. But do you know that the Constitution of India identifies 11 fundamental duties which it expects all of us citizens of India to follow? And this is an important part of that duty. What does it say? All citizens of India must strive to develop scientific temper, humanism, spirit of inquiry and reform. Uh, this is what our constitution expects us to do. So I guess if we follow our constitution, we are being more patriotic. I conduct many interviews and I sometimes ask this question saying, are you patriotic? And everyone of course says, yes, I am patriotic. And then I ask them, Ki bhai, when did you last exhibit patriotism? Ah, that stumps them a little bit. Most of them give this answer, Ki, see, last week I went to see a movie and when they showed the national anthem there, I stopped, <laughs> I stopped eating popcorn and I stood up in my seat. Well, if you develop scientific temper, I guess it would be patriotism of a, a much higher order. We've had two prime ministers in India who have done a lot to develop scientific temper amongst all of us. One was Pandit Nehru. If you happen to read his book, The Discovery of India, he's written there saying that don't believe in things unless they are tried and tested. Have a spirit of inquiry in you. And thirdly, be ready, have the capacity to change your thinking if new evidence points towards that. And then of course we had uh, Atal Bihari Ji Vajpayee, who very famously uh, extended this slogan to add Jai Vigyan. What does Jai Vigyan mean? May victory be to science. I've come to share with you four effective strategies that you can use in your life to improve, develop, nurture your scientific temper. And as is my habit, all those strategies are zero cost. The time to implement them would probably be the time you step out of this hall. I mean, I'm leaving no excuse uh, about why you wouldn't want to implement them because they are zero cost and Indians love things which are zero cost. <laughs> but before we plunge on to those four strategies, there are two things I wanted to uh, touch upon just in a minute. Number one, does being educated help you to become, uh, have more scientific temper? Or if you are a student of science, does it mean that it's easier for you to develop scientific temper? All research says that education literacy and literacy or especially science education doesn't have much to do with whether you will have scientific temper inside you or not. I'll give you an example. All of you have heard of ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization. I mean, it is probably a single largest collection of very highly educated people. They are all PhDs in aeronautical engineering and missile technology and what have you. Four or five years ago, I remember reading in India Today and my IIM colleague who recently retired from ISRO confirmed that before a space vehicle is launched, a prototype of that space vehicle is sent to Tirupati temple for worship and blessings. <laughs> I mean, all of you are laughing at PhDs. <laughs> all I'm trying to say is that, I mean, if those people sitting there can do that, who are you and I? So just remember, education and literacy may not have much to do whether you have scientific temper inside your personality or not. The second thing I wanted to touch upon you before I get on to those four strategies is we must define what scientific temper means. I mean different people may understand it differently. So here is a process which science uses and it's very commonsensical. Even a BA in history can use this. You don't have to be a student of science. 
you first question an something around you that's how all theories start you start questioning why can't it this be better and things like that then you observe thousands of years ago when people didn't know that the earth was rotating around its own axis they always felt that the sun seems to be rising from the same direction so they question is there a fixed direction from where the sun rises and things like that and then they observed and they found yes 100% of the times it seems to be rising from the same direction then hypothesize create your hypothesis saying that if you step out of your house and turn towards the right that's where the sun will rise from because you are th living 1000 years ago and you don't know uh, the rotation of the earth or revolution around the sun or you don't you know nothing so you hypothesize after hypothesizing you generate what are known as testable predictions whatever hypothesis you've generated that must lead to some predictions to test these predictions you once again observe and analyze and only when you realize that in a large enough sample size when the predictions seem to be coming out true in at least more than 50% of the cases then probably it's a theory and finally when you have landed on a theory you communicate that theory to everyone and uh, obviously you find out whether this theory that you have just produced is in consonance with all the existing theories this is a very common sensical process that which all of us use but this is what scientific temper really means the question is whether you use this process uh, in doing uh, things around you and on an everyday basis okay i think let's i don't have to read that out to you four strategy number 1 people whose curiosity is dead cannot have good scientific temper in their personalities you need to be curious these days you know we are more syllabus oriented we are more marks oriented we are not curiosity oriented curiosity means seeking answers to questions for, i mean uh, to events that are happening around you there are thousands of things happening around you and do you have it in your personality to seek answer to them actually seeking an answer may not benefit you in any manner you might not get an increment you might not get any money you might not get a good job and definitely you won't get marks because it is not in the syllabus of whichever exam you are trying our criteria to decide whether we are going to seek answers or not are these four and which is why we are developing a society of people who are least curious about anything that doesn't touch these four parameters and if your curiosity quotient is low i i would rate it better than intelligence quotient if your curiosity quotient is low cq i guess you are not the one who's the right audience for what i'm saying or maybe you are the one who's the right audience for what i'm saying because you'll need to use everything that i'm now going to say it's extremely difficult to assess somebody's curiosity but what i have done is i have brought five questions for you i'll put them up one by one on the board and i'm not going to answer them you ask yourself whether you know the answers to these questions if you know your cq is good enough if you don't know you can go back and try and develop your cq let me put them up one by one because that's the best way i thought i'll be able to uh, demonstrate to you whether okay this is my first question my survey says that more than 75% of people in india do not know the actual meaning of our national anthem we've been singing that since we were in nickers but nobody explained it to us and because nobody explained to our parents when they were children they continue this glorious tradition of not explaining anything which doesn't carry marks in any exam that is going to follow i don't see this national anthem being in any syllabus but imagine singing it without understanding you might as well, well i mean the national anthem could have been in german for example or tamil for example which we don't understand so if you don't know the full meaning of the national anthem that's one point down for you at least those of us are hindus we have always gone to temples and we go and do a parikrama there of the idol i want you to tell me why do you do it and you can give me a religious logic if you want i mean not now in your own mind once again my survey says that 90% of the people earlier it was 75 now it is 90 90% of the people do not know why they are doing parikrama in a temple i would then call it a robotic behavior much in consonance with what uh, we heard in the first lecture about humanoids 
will soon send our, send our humanoid robots to do the pradakshina. <laughs> because we don't know why we are doing it anyway. And there's a second question for those who can answer the first one. The second question is saying, why do we do it clockwise every time? I mean, if you do it anti-clockwise, will the heavens fall down or something? <laughs> you need to ask this because otherwise your behavior is coming very close to that humanoid which he explained. Are you a humanoid or a human? So try and answer this question. If you can answer it fine, your CQ is good, otherwise it's bad. I'm asking you questions which are not there in any syllabus but which should have been known by you till now. Why does a chapati puff up? You've seen hundreds of times chapatis being made. Why does it puff up? And this answer is not sufficient that there is water vapor in the water in the dough and therefore that comes up. No, you need to explain it to me properly. I mean to yourself as of now. Those of you who are interested in really finding out the answers can email me and I'll send you the correct answers. But provided you tried to locate it. You have Google with you, na? Google wasn't there when I was young. So why does a chapati puff up? That's the third question. I didn't bring more than five because I didn't want to put you in a depression. <laughs> this is another expression which most of us use. Touch wood. Harshil must have used touch wood. There are all the people have come and filled up my auditorium. I hope half of them don't walk out after the breakfast or in the snacks. <laughs> to protect our good luck, we always say touch wood. Why do we say touch wood? Why not touch metal, touch water or something else? Have you ever, if you, do, if you have not tried to find out, probably it's robotic behavior. You're doing it because someone else told you and it doesn't seem to harm you, so you're doing it. But you wouldn't try to find out why. Your curiosity quotient is not what it should be. And my last question. Why do we blow off candles on a birthday, though putting off a burning flame is considered inauspicious in our culture? I mean, even a two-year-old, if you take him to a Hindi movie and if he sees a scene in which, you know, that lamp due to a gust of wind blows off, he'll say, now, daddy, the heroine's father is going to die. <laughs> I mean, the association is so strong between something like that happening and something bad happening. And we do it on a birthday and nobody complains. Even the elders in the family clap because they want to eat the cake. <laughs> so this question is open to people of all ages. All these five questions are open to people of all ages. Because I am so confident because in their generation also nobody questioned them. And it didn't fetch them any marks in their HSSC or wherever. So they have chosen not to find out answers. Okay, let's go to strategy number two. Strategy one, this is enough, as I said, anything more than this would put you in a depression. What is the strategy number two to develop scientific temper? Believe only if the conclusion is statistically valid. You don't have to be a student of statistics in order to find out what is statistically valid. I just explained it to you when I explained scientific temper. If you observe a certain thing happening a large number of times and if it seems to be happening more than 50% of the times at all, neutral venues, neutral times, wherever, it shouldn't be that it happens only in Nagpur, it doesn't happen in London, those are dicey conclusions. If it seems to be happening more than 50% true in a large enough sample size, I would say that is the statistical method of believing in something. Let me ask you my first question. Are some movements or days more auspicious than others? How many of you believe that some movements or some days are more auspicious? Those of you who have got married, I'm sure got married at something like 8.33. <laughs> I mean, your wife continues to fight with us in spite of that 8.33. <laughs> so did it work or did it not work? I don't think it worked. You didn't, enough, you didn't look at a large enough sample to find out whether that movement was really auspicious or not. But you continue believing it because your sons will now get married at 9.26. <laughs> so the tradition, the glorious tradition continues. There are no auspicious movements or days. I am sure the TED people did not look for an auspicious day or an hour to fix up this meeting. It was completely decided by the availability of this hall. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm putting up a second question. I'm just putting two or three because of the constraints of time. Do mental illnesses become more severe on no moon days? Amavasya, what we call. Do they become more severe? And you'll have hundreds of people giving you a lecture about how, you know, this happens when on, on, on an Amavasya. According to me, it has no statistical basis. Insane people continue to behave in the same insane manner even on a no moon day. I mean, some of you can try it out on yourselves if you want. <laughs> These two conclusions have absolutely no statistical basis, but still we believe them. But what I'd like to really share with you is a study done by Dr. Jayan Naradikar who stays in Pune about astrological predictions. You know, he did a very simple experiment. He gathered 100 horoscopes, I did not write who's they, whom they belong to, and he invited various astrologers to come and take those horoscopes from him, photocopies of them, and he said, answer only three questions, which had no subjectivity in it. One question was, is this guy dead or alive? Second question was, is this guy married or not married? And the third question was, I think, is he uh, a male or a female? And he said, you take, use whatever techniques you have, and after a week, come back and give me the answers. So about 60 people from Pune, this experiment was done at Pune, and it's recorded. And he's done it thrice in the last 10 years with different sets of questions. But approximately, let's say three questions, about 60 people took it, so that's 180 data points, and there were 100 horoscopes, so the total data points were 18,000. A very substantial sample size. And then he compared the results, he just compared the total group's results about how correct the results were and how incorrect they were. He didn't compare them astrologer by astrologer, just for the whole group. And third time in the last 10 years, he has to report, or he had to report, that the correlation, that means the success percentage is far below 50. Which means astrological predictions apparently don't have psycho uh, a statistical basis. I mean, imagine a Padma Vibhushan physicist and an astronomer conducting these experiments. You've got to believe him, isn't it? If you don't believe, I guess you should answer this question. If astrology could predict the time of the death, maybe. It's, they claim that it can predict the time of death, just like they claim that they can predict uh, auspicious or non-auspicious movements. Why doesn't any life insurance company use these predictions? I mean, if I was a life insurance guy and I'm selling a one crore policy to a guy, to another guy, I'll first have his horoscope examined. Kiar, this guy will give me my first premium of one lakh and then die. So I'm suffering a loss of 99 lakhs of rupees in within a month or two. So this is a great risk. I will not sell my policy to this guy. No life insurance company in the whole world even touches astrological predictions. I mean, wherever money and profits are involved, uh, people go against their beliefs because they think that they'll be able to earn more money. But even they don't do it. So if you still want to believe in auspicious movements, please go ahead. Okay, we're coming to strategy three. I'm more than halfway through. In India, especially in India, we face a lot of public obstinacy. Some part of which was covered by Mrs. Khan when she talked about the kind of architecture that we do and the kind of degradation that we allow our cities to go into. We have a tremendous amount of public obstinacy. The example that I have for you are here. Do you know that in India, the number of temples is more than the number of schools plus hospitals taken together? Does it sound like a very old and a mature culture? Where the number of temples is more than the number... At least we can stop building fur temples further. <laughs> but at least from now onwards, nahin? but we will not agree to that. We'll, I still have more people coming to me asking for donations for temples than for schools and hospitals. What do you say to that? I don't give to both of them, of course. <laughs> Why are helmets not compulsory for two-wheeler riders? When experiment after experiment has confirmed that it is fatal in a very large number of cases. Nagpur, which, hap which wants to be a smart city, still is dilly-dallying whether helmets for two-wheeler -wheel riders should be made compulsory. I mean, what else is this other than public obstinacy? Why do we object to sex education in schools? Many people probably think that sex education uh, has a chapter on the act itself. 
uh, I don't know, maybe they must be thinking like that because they oppose it tooth and nail saying that you will morally corrupt my children. But then they go and see all kinds of TV shows <laughs> which they don't realize I have already corrupted them so much that this <laughs> sex edu education can't do anything more. Why does homosexuality continue to be a crime in our country when all across the world it's been proved and we are one of the brightest communities in India. We have very sharp brains. Look at what we are doing when we go outside India. But homosexuality, the moment you utter that word, oh, our religion doesn't allow it. <laughs> Ramdev Baba even says, I'll clear, uh, cure your homosexuality through my medicines. <laughs> I mean, he'll get a Nobel Prize, no, for that if he does that. But it's not a disease at all, but nobody is willing to accept. According to me, if you want to improve your scientific temper, oppose public obstinacy wherever you come across it. If you are not actively working to remove those uh, misunderstandings, at least oppose it wherever, wherever you, you know, get an opportunity. My last strategy. I found this to be a, a major kind of a thing which, you know, reduces your scientific temper. Understand your religion through its philosophy instead of through its rituals. Today I am going to go on a fast. Tomorrow I have to go to that temple. Third day I have to worship a tree. Fine, go ahead, do that. I am not saying don't do it. But when I ask you, are you a Hindu? You say yes. I keep referring to Hindu examples because I was born in a Hindu family. So I know that religion a little more than other religions. People say, you know, it's very difficult to find out the philosophy. A common man doesn't even know what the philosophy is. So today, I'm going to remove that block also. I have brought in the, my next slide, which is going to be my second last slide. It is not difficult to identify the philosophy behind each religion. Today, I have brought to share with you seven principles on which Hinduism is based. It's, it's, it's not difficult. It's, the question is whether you agree to them. If you don't agree to them, don't call yourself a Hindu. That's what I'm trying to say. Hinduism is broad enough even to accept atheists in its fold. Do you know that? That outside of Buddhism, Hinduism is the only religion which says you can be an atheist and still be a Hindu. No other religion says that. Okay? Let, let, let's go and see what the principles of Hinduism are. Seven pillars I have called them. And you have those books na, called Excel for Dummies. <laughs> this is also a lesson in the same, uh, you know, series. Though I wouldn't want to call you dummies. Hinduism believes in rebirth. That you are getting reborn. That means you are even now reborn from what you were last, in your last janam. And rebirth is usually used as a method of reward and punishment. Simple enough to understand. You may believe or not believe, but simple enough to understand. It says that the main objective of every Hindu should be that you must get out of this cycle of rebirths and attain what is known as salvation or moksha. That's your objective. Your objective is not to attend a TED lecture. I mean, it could be a smaller objective, but the main objective is that. It believes in this principle of non-duality, or what is known as Advait. It says, the creator and the creation, that means us, actually are part of the same entity. This philosophy does not exist in any other religion on the earth. It says when you are born on this earth, your destiny is predetermined. Someone has written that destiny for you and that's how you are going to live your life. Extreme tolerance. Hinduism is one of, is a libertarian's delight according to me. Extreme tolerance. It doesn't insist on the clothes that you wear. It doesn't insist on the God that you choose. It doesn't insist on the way you worship that God. Everything is left to you. As I said, it even allows you to be an atheist and still be a Hindu. Extreme tolerance. It has defined those four stages of life just like a marketing management expert would do. You have Brahmacharya Ashram when you are a bachelor. Then you are a Grahastha Ashram where your main job is to raise a family, procreate, increase the population, whatever. <laughs> the third stage is Vanaprastha Ashram where you start thinking ki now I am going to retire. So how am I going to detach myself from all these worldly and material pleasures? And finally, you have the Sanyas Ashram where you actually retire mentally. You don't have to go and stay in a jungle in order to 
be a part of sannyas ashram so it defines these four stages and says that if you want to live life fully then you objectives of each of these stages is different please live according to what that stage asks you to live if you live like a brahmacharya when you are in a grahastha ashram you are doing a wrong thing if you behave like a sanyasi when you are in the vanaprastha ashram wrong thing every life stage has its own objective and you are supposed to behave accordingly excellent excellent management lesson according to me but nahi <laughs> and then of course the last one is the famous karmanneva adhikarasya mahafaleshu kadachana which means don't bother so much about your objective bother more about the job that you are doing or whatever you are wanting to achieve don't bother about the results of the objective that's it i mean this covers 99% of hinduism this is what i mean by saying that you should understand your religion through its philosophy and not through the rituals of worshiping this and you know washing your hands before you do that and all those kinds which we do and if you do this i am sure you you you're going to you're going to improve the scientific temper inside you that's it this is a thought that i would like you to take back home from this remember this is not a fight between science and religion it's a fight between you and irrationality if i call you irrational you will take it as an insult but then you'll go and behave exactly as how a dictionary behaves an irrational person will let's accept that increasing scientific temper is indeed a national task if all of us try to do it i think the government will find it easier to implement their programs it's a different matter that many in the government themselves need to improve their scientific temper <laughs> that's different but we are like them so i guess so a big thank you for your patience for giving me a patient hearing <laughs>